Thanks, Adam. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm excited to be here, particularly in the, the Citadel, Google, uh, because I think the uh, broad cultural force that intelligent, rational, technologically sophisticated, scientifically uh, innovative uh, players are able to bring to our world is so crucial and right now so underutilized. I think we have a huge opportunity, you have a huge opportunity, and frankly, as you'll hear, a responsibility. And I'll be talking about how the challenges are not really just problems to be figured out, but they're an existential challenge to our whole way of being human and to our self-understanding and our orientation. I'll get into that. Mainly, I want to talk about three things. One of them is this idea of a meta-crisis. Very often, we talk about global warming, and, and perhaps in some conversations, we have a broader view, and we talk about the larger ecological emergency, which isn't reducible to global warming. The destruction of so much of the rainforest, for instance, shrinking the lungs of the planet is not exactly the same as global warming. And this broader ecological predicament is a lot more severe than people realize. It's part of what I want to express. On the other hand, when people have the courage to face ex directly the actual nature of our moment and how in dire it is in some ways, it tends to bring about a, an orientation of despair. There's a huge community that's grown up, for, for example, around the idea of civilizational collapse. The idea that it is inevitable that we will see societal collapse relatively near term. I disagree with that and I'll be explaining why that's not only logically flawed but morally reprehensible and uh, I, I, that's an important piece of what I want to share. However, what it boils down to is an opportunity and a challenge for us each individually. I often use the metaphor of a, a Zen koan. This meta crisis is an impossible question. Like in, in Zen, the monk is sometimes given an impossible question like, what is the sound of one hand clapping? or show me your original face, the one you had before your parents were born. And those questions stop the mind and they, and they require the aspirant to go beyond their whole way of being. It's, it's, it's a challenge that's nonlinear. You can't figure out the answer to a koan. You have to dwell in the tensions that the koan creates. I think this crisis represents that kind of a transformational pressure cooker that admittedly most of humanity is busy ignoring and not looking at. We live in a culture pretty profoundly dedicated to a kind of radical denialism. On the other hand though, we live in this time for a reason. It is an opportunity and ultimately I find it thrilling and inspiring and I hope by the end of this talk you'll be feeling the same way. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about is, is a deeper dive into what time it is on the planet and what that means for us, the nature of this tipping point, as uh, an existential matter. And then finally I want to talk to you about what the innovators, and here at Google it's like a citadel of what I call the innovators, the unique role that innovators will play or fail to play at a very crucial moment in the whole evolutionary trajectory of this human experiment. Now this is a, a little bit of a different kind of talk than you've probably heard before. You might think of it as a meta-synthesis. A synthesis might bring together a lot of data and uh, insights and factoids of a variety of kinds to deliver a, a shift of view. That's what a synthesis is. But if you 
really want to comprehend what's going on right now, it requires a whole series of such syntheses. And so what I'm going to be delivering is a metasynthesis that therefore will not be peppered with all kinds of references to particular studies or to uh, facts you haven't heard before. It's going to really have to do with uh, an, an invitation for you to make your way of seeing an object of your attention, to make your way of being an object of your inspection, and to draw you much more profoundly into an opportunity for new possibility. So I invite you to suspend your usual way of listening in order to be available to making real use, downloading this meta-synthesis that I'll be offering. Uh, another thing that is important to set out just as a vocabulary for us to use is the idea of worldviews, which we've all heard of, that people occupy certain worldviews. And we generally talk about the differing worldviews, for instance, of Republicans and Democrats uh, in the United States. Uh, or we might talk about the worldviews of people in a, an African country or uh, diverse, you know, indigenous worldviews, et cetera. But it's important to understand just how profound and far-reaching that idea is. That, in a sense, when we occupy a certain way of seeing reality, all kinds of implicit assumptions are part and parcel of our worldview. And just that we can recognize worldview, worldviews and even observe some things about our own worldview doesn't deliver us from the limiting function of worldviews. A worldview is a total perspective. It has implicit in it values. It has implicit in it attitudes. It has implicit in it ways of relating to other people. And most of that tends to be invisible to the occupant of any worldview. And so as we begin to talk here about how our crisis is operating, we have to look at how the conflict of worldviews plays. And uh, I'll, I'll go into this a bit more as, as we apply it. The you know, where are we right now? Well, I think that among Democratic voters recently, a poll uh, identified uh, climate change, which is really the proxy for all ecological issues, as I think the fifth most urgent issue in the minds of Democratic voters. But in the last year, if you've been paying attention, you've probably seen a new IPCC report that outlines just how devastating a 1.5 centigrade raise of global temperatures would be. You've also seen a, a US climate report that underlines those findings. You've maybe seen the new findings that show that ocean warming has been taking place way more rapidly than anyone had previously been projecting by somewhere between 40 and 60 percent. You may have, uh, well, I won't keep, this is a litany. We hear it all the time. You don't really need that education from me. What you are aware of is that we're not addressing it and that the struggle to begin to address it effectively is, if, if you've paid attention even to European politics where the countries there are, are really our leaders in the world, it's, it's not as if the level of awareness and action that the European countries are taking is adequate to the problem at all. And here in the United States, nothing is happening. So the crisis, even if we think about it in climate or ecological terms, and the meta-crisis is much more than that, still hinges on cultural changes and cultural communication. And all, all kinds of factors are interacting. You get serious about climate, pretty soon you're really interested in campaign finance reform. Then you're interested in reforming the balkanization of media. Then you're interested in voting rights. I mean, it, you, you bounce around from issue to issue as, as an activist because everything is entangled. We have an entangled series of crises. If you've 
looked closely at what's happening in the educational system, not just in the United States, but around the world, you discover, wow, our whole way of educating our, ourselves and younger people is in a crisis. The healthcare system in the United States is particularly in crisis. We also can see that there are crises that are psychological, addiction, uh, depression, anxiety, breakdown of family and the interaction of family breakdown and neighborhood community breakdown. We, we can talk about this crisis from multiple angles, but really there's only one world. And no matter what lens we put on, no matter what analytics we focus our attention on, we're catching a partial view of a larger phenomenon, and it's a single phenomenon. We may be thinking of it as an ecological crisis. We may be thinking of it as a psychological or spiritual crisis. We may be thinking of it as a cultural crisis and a breakdown of community, family, et cetera. We may be thinking of it as a crisis of government and economics and finance. And it is all of these things. But it's not reducible to any one of them. That's why it's a meta crisis. And in a way, crisis isn't quite the right word. It's, it's really kind of a predicament. The ecological uh, analysis that is simplest and easiest to communicate argues essentially that we have gone for some years into overshoot. I think it's summarized best by a book called Overshoot by William Catton that was published 30 years ago almost. And it basically identifies a way of understanding any ecosystem. Whether you're talking about an island or a pond or a petri dish or a planet. And whatever ecosystem you're describing, whatever environment, it has a, a, a certain carrying capacity. And its carrying capacity is the quantity of any particular animal or plant, any life form, that can be sustainably supported in that ecosystem over time permanently. And uh, when you exceed the carrying capacity of that ecosystem, you, you might successfully uh, continue for a while by drawing down certain resources temporarily. The problem is, is that those resources you draw down then are in shorter supply, and you may have reduced the ultimate carrying capacity of that ecosystem. You've drawn down non-renewable resources, or you've damaged the systems through which resources can regenerate. And Kenton's historical analysis is that in an accident of uh, historical sequence, uh, Around 1500, Europeans discovered the New World and very quickly were able to draw huge amounts of resources from the New World. So the European Western countries went through a period of rapid economic expansion based on the availability of unlimited resources, which he calls the cornucopian myth. The idea is that there are, are now and will always be unlimited resources. And that was proven out because very soon after the discovery of the, the new world and, and the full exploitation of the incredible rise of wealth that that brought, there was the discovery of coal and then the discovery of oil and then the discovery of natural gas and the exploitation of all the fossil fuels. So we have gone through a process in now world culture, because those European countries that originally discovered the worldview, it is the, their legacy that is now the pattern of the whole modern world. No matter what part of the world you go to, the systems that are dominant are the legacy of that original, you know, the conquest of the world by the white man's tribes, we might call it. Uh, so that world has now instantiated a presumption of 
unlimited resources and never-ending economic expansion. And we're now in the neighborhood of a peak oil moment in which the efficiency with which we can make use of the remaining fossil fuels is degrading. And that's periodically sending shocks. It's one of the reasons that our financial markets are so jumpy, why there is so much pessimism, why so many people say that things are on the wrong track, et cetera, et cetera. This sense of disquiet, this sense that we are headed for some kind of apocalyptic calamity is, is sort of in the, in the water system. You go to the multiplex, three out of four movies are about saving the world. Well, we wouldn't be saving the world if it weren't that we believed in some way that something about what we rest in is endangered. So there's a, a, a deep malaise and a, and a confusion that, that is culturally pervasive that partly comes from this intuition of this situation that the cornucopian era is now under challenge. I personally believe that we will discover a relatively free, relatively clean energy source at some point, and that there will be another round of cornucopian possibility. But the unsustainability of an, a long-term cornucopian orientation needs to be, well, the sustainability of it needs to be examined. The presumption that we can simply take for granted that this orientation will be a permanent condition of our existence deserves critical inspection. Let me uh, digress for a moment and introduce a vocabulary. I, I called you guys innovators, and I was drawing on uh, a very simple categorization that I, I make of what I consider the three most important conversations that human beings are having at this time. We are at a time in which we are reaching an inflection point, and we are beginning to have serious conversations in which our very best intelligence is in dialogue with itself in the form of the most intelligent participants. But we're having three different conversations that I think, each, each of which I believe, are essential. And those conversations are not in dialogue with one another. So one of them I call the innovators. And I very frequently mention Larry Page as one of the leading thinkers of that innovator conversation along with many, many, many others. Too many to mention adequately, but I'll throw out a few names, but the, the obvious people, Elon Musk, Bill Gates, uh, but Sam Harris, uh, you know, they're, they're not all entrepreneurs necessarily. Rational, you know, Steven Pinker, a variety of in innovators who are in, in the most powerful position right now and are seen broadly in our culture as the people who are creating the future. Because not only are they capturing the flag in terms of technological and scientific advances, they're capturing the flag in terms of the entrepreneurial deployment of those advances. And therefore, they have the cultural influence and the money to really back up their intention to be the change and to map the future of possibility. But I kind of briefly alluded to this point of view that I describe and give the simple name ecologists. And I would say the ecologists ascribe to the, the narrative I, I offered, that the, the cornucopian myth you know, is a myth, that the Malthusian attitude, which is the, that we are headed for a collision, you know, the Malthusians have been proven wrong again and again and again and again throughout history, so the evidence kind of stacks up to support a cornucopian orientation. Except we're dealing with a collision of a different character than we ever have before, and we don't see solutions. I'll get into that in a minute. So I think that ecologists, you know, there's a great range of people I would call ecologists. I would include my friend Michael Dowd, the evolutionary evangelist who's uh, a very rational uh, character, or, but I would also include, for, in, for instance, there's a nonprofit organization here in San Francisco called the Pachamama Alliance, where uh, a financier, uh, Bill Twist, and his wife, Lynn, who was the uh, 
le kind of leader of the, the Hunger Project for, for many years, had a visit to the Ashwar people in uh, the Amazon in Ecuador and formed an alliance with indigenous people and they're uh, bringing services into that part of the world and trying to preserve chunks of the forest, the habitat of those people. But what they're arguing for more fundamentally is that there is a kind of we have lost our memory of how to live on this planet in a way that doesn't destroy it and that there's something fundamental in the existential orientation of a life that knows at a, at a deep unconscious or pre-conscious level that it is killing its host. That all of us are sick, it would be argued, because how we feed ourselves, how we transport ourselves, how we earn our living and everything else are intertwined inexorably with a larger system that is completely unsustainable and it's producing horrific effects that offend us morally and spiritually. And the ecologists are arguing in a, in, in a variety of ways. Some of them simply have to do with a a rational argument about how to preserve our future. Others have to do with a, a deeper, you know, eco, the whole field of eco-psychology is a, a, one of the expressions of this ecological point of view. And they're very intelligent, very well-read, very deeply, you know, I'm going to be offering you a link to a rather terrifying but very well-researched paper called Deep Adaptation by uh, an academic ecologist, somebody in the field of uh, sustainability, uh, it's kind of business management for sustainability is now a pretty big field and he's a, he's a leading expert there and he's arguing for this scenario of societal collapse. Now there's a third group that I think is equally important that I call the evolutionaries and I would number myself as an evolutionary. What, what characterizes evolutionaries is that we recognize evolution as a multidimensional affair. It wasn't just biological evolution, which is what people usually think of, the adaptive emergence of new traits, but there was cosmic evolution before the Earth was formed and in the early years of the Earth that just took place in the physiosphere, before it moved into the biosphere and created the biosphere. And really, the most important evolution that's been going on for the last 500 years has been cultural evolution, the evolution in the noetic sphere, the interiors, the collective learning of human beings. And it's here that we have our biggest problem, because no matter how much we might locate our crisis as a matter of maintaining a habitable Earth, our ability to reach agreements and make intelligent collective decisions is crucial to any solution we might want to instantiate. And we can all see how broken, we say our politics are broken, but it's a much more pervasive matter. So evolutionaries are those who take a meta perspective on the perspectives in play and recognize that we are only effective if we can put on the lens of the person we're in discourse with. And if we can draw, uh, draw ourselves beyond the limits of the worldview we're inhabiting. And that to do that, we need a lot of things that radically reformat the hard drive. For example, higher states of consciousness, uh, particularly, uh, you know, th there are different species of those higher states that we can visit through entheogens or psychedelics or that we can intentionally cultivate through practice of meditation, a variety of approaches. That, that's only one part of what evolutionaries bring in. Part of what evolutionaries are able to see is the way that worldviews define everything we can see. So evolutionaries are, are looking at this whole matter in an evolutionary context and are recognizing its evolutionary implications. And there's a lot more to say about that, but very briefly, we are alive at a time when, from an evolutionary perspective of 
life on Earth, of, of, of not just the human species, but most in, even marginally intelligent species, all mam not all, but most mammalian species, there's an existential crisis brewing right now. What happens in your lifetimes will have profound implications to the future, not just of human life, but of every, you know, every charismatic uh, megafauna species that you might care about. And we are here. Who is going to be a part of the creation of that future? And who has an opportunity to make a moral difference? We are the ones. When we take that seriously, it tends to sober us a lot. This particular moment in time, I think maybe some of you have noticed the 11 year time frame that was identified in the most recent IPCC report about 1.5 uh, degree centigrade temperature increase. We have to make radical changes that tr transform our whole pattern of our whole economy relative to what powers us, fossil fuels, and accomplish it in something like 11 years, according to that particular analysis. Now, is that analysis absolutely dependable? Every analysis and every perspective, by the way, is both true and partial. I think what we can know and how well we can know it needs to be viewed with a kind of self-critical awareness. That that 11 year, well, you know, at the end, nobody knows for sure. But really well informed, intelligent, deep people have done their best to quantify our window of opportunity. And they've come up with 11 years. That's enough for me. What I have decided and what I offer to you is the idea that as much as you may look at things through a certain worldview, and as, as much as that may be inescapable, that is, you can't just notice that there are multiple worldviews and escape the limits of your own. You are bound to it, but you can be in conversation with perspectives that are only apparent from outside your worldview. It is a little like state-specific memory. You know, the, I remember as a kid seeing a kind of, I don't think it was a Hitchcock movie, but sort of a similar to a Hitchcock movie about a guy who could only remember certain things when he was drunk or sometimes in a rage or whatever. Only in a certain state is cer are certain things perceptible. Well, it, we can think about some of what we're dealing with using that as a, as a useful metaphor. It, it illuminates the fact that we are actually occupying entirely different realities. And yet we talk with one another in a single body of discourse as if there were a single knowable truth that we all ought to be able to talk one another into. Well, this orientation that we have a definable problem that we can figure out and that has a, a, a single definable solution is, is completely obsolete. We are, we are facing in this meta crisis a necessity of transformation on every level of human life. It's, it's, it's what I refer to in my book as whole systems change. That means that there are psychological changes. What our idea is of a successful life well lived. What our ideas are about satisfying relationships. What we aspire to what gives our life meaning and purpose, the ways that we enjoy, all of that's going to have to go through a morph. It's, it does arrive on a personal level. Maybe we begin by thinking of this as an engineering problem of coming up with a, a relatively free and cheap energy source that will liberate us from this problem, but that, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't suffice. In fact, there are analyses of what we're facing that don't focus even on ecology at all, that regard the whole matter as a matter of a self-accelerating pattern. Uh, maybe some of you are aware of a very important book that was published in 2017 by the physicist Jeffrey West, who's the director of the Santa Fe Institute. He 
The title of the book is Scale. And in it, he used the tools of physics, mainly math and ratios, to analyze biological and social systems. And he, had, he came up with a lot of very interesting insights about met metabolism and lifespan and cities and so forth. But to me, the most interesting single piece of that broad analysis was his tracking historically of the major transformations of the techno-economic means of production that power human societies, like the discovery and, and use of stone tools or agriculture or you know, he marked each one that had an advent of a, of a, of a major increase. Because it definitely proceeds in a stage process. It, it isn't a smooth, ramped trajectory. And what he noticed was that each transformation happened faster and faster and faster and faster. And he noted, gosh, if we're all together involved in a self-accelerating pattern, we have a design problem because a self-accelerating pattern is self-terminating. You can't go faster and faster forever. If you track changes on a timeline, and at first they're very slow, and then they're a little faster and faster and faster and faster and faster and faster, you come upon a time singularity. And he identified, as a result of that analysis, that a grand unified theory of sustainability was the way he put it, that combined our understandings of economics and politics and social theory and all the hard sciences would be necessary in order to turn that around. He imagined that one of these stage transitions might give us the breathing space to make that kind of a radical turn toward a permanently sustainable presence on the planet. But it was really something he conceived of abstractly as a, as, a, as a hypothetical. Another futurist, Peter Russell, came to the same conclusions, examining entirely different uh, data. But in a way, it's an extension of the thesis that Al Alvin Toffler put forward almost 30 years ago in, in Future Shock. And part of our meta crisis is simply the human adaptation. We talk a lot about how much our lives have changed because we live so much of it online and our relationships are mediated and that's affecting us in both good and bad ways and it's very different now to be 10 or 15 or 20, you know, everybody's going through a, a transformation because of that and that's a piece of our meta crisis. The argument there is that change is stressful and complexification is stressful and this self-accelerating crisis is speeding up change and complexification to a point that it's beginning to test the neurological limits of human adaptation. And so that, that may be true. It's important to realize, though, that when we look at all of these critical tipping points, I, I've been mentioning primarily depressing, negative ones. But there are equally inspiring, potentially positive ones in play. Not just technologically, but you know, for instance, all the wisdom traditions of every culture on Earth have been in conversation now, in a, at least a beginning way, for over 50, maybe 75 years. And we now have a couple of generations of Westerners who've applied themselves to the technologies of awakening or enlightenment that come from the East. And those people are in conversation with each other, informed by the beneficial influence of uh, scientific analytical tools. I mean, just comparative religion, for example, but, but much more rigorous than that. We are, we're quantifying all kinds of things. And our, 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 our development of the technology of becoming our best, uh, uh, not just consciousness hacking, but peak performance as a general category, is, is, is reaching a whole new level of uh, ob ob objective uh, clarification. And we have a lot of people who are applying those tools and who are achieving different levels of clarity and excellence who are advancing the dialogue. Just as in AI, we, get, we may get to a point where intelligent machines can redesign even more intelligent machines, we already have 
people who are embodying excellence who are refining the field of embodying excellence. And there's the beginnings of the virtuous cycle that might bring about a, a positive singularity of that kind. And there are, there are other dynamics that are very important. One of the things that I, I get into in, in my book pretty, uh, pretty richly is our disasters are going to open windows of opportunity for more fundamental systems redesign that after it's too late will be when it becomes possible to do many things. One of the problems that we have with uh, the, the current di dialogue is that everybody participating in it, for the most part, ve very few, a few evolutionaries, are free enough from the implications not to be so gripped by the fear and grief that come upon us when we contemplate civilizational collapse or the end of the human experiment, that they're able to have enough free attention to participate with all their capacities. And so a big subsection of what I teach and what I bring to people is, a, is a, an understanding that, you know, we're, no matter what, you were going to, at some point in your life, experience what the Buddhists call the, the heavenly messengers, sickness, old age, and death. You, you, would ex you will, and we all will, experience loss. We will all experience pain. And we'll eventually cease to exist. And that's always been OK with us. So the fact that we're facing some of this collectively, that the most extreme challenges in every one of our individual lives are challenges that we face together, this is stimulating and will stimulate a new species of conversations. Our intelligence will be in conversation with itself in new ways. And the people who can do that best are the innovators, because you, collectively speaking, are the dominant influence in culture right now. But because your worldview tends to confine what you think of as relevant and interesting to the kinds of things you already recognize, you're tending not to recognize the fresh perspectives and important truths that are also being brought forward by the intelligent conversations among ecologists or evolutionaries. And so it will be the, not the, not the uh, kind of what we might call the yang heroism, the very masculine heroism, uh, kind of like Hercules bursting through of the innovators saving the day with new breakthroughs that will be sufficient because the cultural dimension is going to require a coming together of the human family and of all our intelligence. So it is innovators who, by waking up to a certain fundamental epistemic humility, recognizing that the way you know and the way you see, however clearly and how, how, with whatever profoundly penetrating laser vision you may have, is only a part of the process and that you need to be in conversation with other perspectives, and particularly the families of conversation that I'm lining out here that I call ecologists and evolutionaries. So leadership among innovators who take seriously your unique responsibility is perhaps one of the crucial things that can turn the Titanic. Many of you are probably familiar with the idea of the trim tab. This is something Bucky Fuller talked about a lot. When you have a really, you know, the Queen Mary, a really large ocean liner, a rudder, uh, turns the ship, the, the turning radius is way too wide. You, 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 the efficiency of navigation is, is compromised by the very size of the ship. Even with massive rudders, they turn too slow. But if you put another little rudder on the end, not very big, with a very powerful motor and all kinds of bracing, it turns way, fa way faster. That's a trim tab, that extra rudder. And if we're going to turn this Titanic, it's going to be because of little acts of heroism by many, many people in a, in, a, in a broad complex. It will be necessary for our best intelligence not to just rearrange the deck chairs in this Titanic metaphor, but to break into the engine room and grab the wheel and actually turn the ship. And I want you to consider that this is an inspiring 
and ennobling prospect, that it's thrilling to be alive right now. In, the, uh, uh, in some of the, you, know, you might say the Jungian and, and soul-based psychological and spiritual traditions, it is said that we consented to be born in this time. Whether we think of it in those terms or not, we certainly are born in this time. This is our time. Whatever your character is, it is going to be expressed in the peculiar mix of opportunities and challenges that present themselves in this time. And so you have coincided with a moment in which the events in your lifetime are going to be of enormous consequence on an evolutionary scale. And you have some measure of intelligence and capacity and power. There's a chilling poem uh, written by Drew Dellinger uh, with lines that go something like, uh, it's 3.23 in the morning and I can't sleep. I keep hearing the voices of my great-great-grandchildren calling to me, asking me, what did you do when the planet was unraveling? What did you do when the oceans were dying? Once you knew, what did you do? That's a tremendous moral seriousness. And the paradox is, we can't fulfill it if we let the weight of that, that sobriety kill our sense of humor. Things are far too serious for us to lose our sense of humor. Things are far too serious for us to lose our capacity for lightheartedness. We are being asked to come into the game with a yes, we can kind of an attitude, a can-do positive orientation. And when you begin to recognize where you really are, I think instead of arriving in this orientation of believing in collapse, which in my opinion is a, a problem because mindset becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Things are far too serious for us to allow that pessimism to condition our way of participating such that the potential heroism that we might bring to this complex is dented by our depression or our discouragement. So a whole different quality of human relationship is possible and asked from us right now. We have to turn to one another. We've been given a koan, but I can't answer it by myself. The only answer to that koan is from us. It's, it's a collective koan. And the biggest problems in our lives are the same as the biggest problems in each other's lives. Whatever the challenges that you are facing personally, they're dwarfed by our collective challenges. And yet, those are an opportunity for a life of meaning and purpose and contribution. So that's what I'm dedicating my life to. Uh, at the end here, we'll put up a slide with some, uh, just a few links, mainly to my work and also to this paper I mentioned, which can serve as a two by four across the forehead, the deep adaptation paper by Jem Bendel. It's at uh, lifeworth.com slash deepadaptation.pdf. My websites are newrepublicoftheheart.com about my book, newrepublicoftheheart.org, which is the nonprofit I've founded, and terrypatton.com. And I invite you to check all of that out. And I hope you'll read my book or consider listening to the audiobook. I've read the audiobook, and so you can absorb it that way if that's going to flow in your life better. And I hope we have time for a few questions. I wanted to get your impression of the cornucopian myth that we're kind of fulfilling here at Google, where there's kind of this, there's still this impression of unlimited expansion on the web. So there's kind of maybe some Im uh, impression there's maybe a lower um, sort of material cost by servicing you know, uh, equivalent services or products on the web. Um, and sort of as a, as a Googler myself, you know, our, you know, our targets every quarter are higher than they were previously. Our, you know, our, our need to fulfill, you know, click volume is kind of continuing to increase. I'm just curious on your perspective on like, uh, first how the cornucopia myth has sort of translated to the digital age, but also as Googlers, you know, you said we're innovators, but are we also not, you know, do we, do we have a space in trying to curb some of the expansion like, uh, and turning the Titanic to your illusion there um, from, from where yeah, we sit? Yeah, I, I think that 
to some degree, you have to succeed in the system that you're in, even if you see that it has some unhealthy dynamics. So your participation in doing your job of helping Google succeed this quarter is probably not itself part of turning the Titanic, no. But it is, um, I, 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 I don't think it's evil, right? I think that it's, it's, it's part of perpetuating a system that needs to go through more radical change. And as a participant in this, uh, in this process, you are, you know, part of what you can do is, and I, I, what I would recommend, is to grow yourself into a, like you, most of you Googlers are relatively young and you have a lot of life and capacity ahead of you. And so as, as you cultivate your consciousness and your capacity to be a friend to another person and you know, there are a variety of, of, of very ordinary human maturations that are necessary for you to be the kind of leader that's going to be able to be effective in changing the, you know, the, the, the fundamental systems redesign is probably going to not be possible until there are disruptions, positive or negative. If somebody comes up with that cheap, free alternative to fossil fuels, that's going to be a massive disruption to the whole economy. That's going to change a lot. And you might have an opportunity to write the code for what replaces it. If there is a, a massive uh, ecological disaster that kills tens of millions of people and shocks the world into a whole new orientation to our place on the planet, and we've got countries all over the world revising their international financial agreements, some people, perhaps this isn't your area of expertise, I suspect, but we're going to be rewriting the rules of our international financial system. We're going to be rewriting that code. So your guy's capacity to think metasystemically and identify the rule sets that are going to genuinely be sustainable is hugely important. If, if, if for example, in October or se September, October, November of 2008, the brightest young thinkers in uh, financial and economic theory were giving papers to Hank Paulson and Ben Bernanke and George W. Bush that would have shown them a way of making good use of that crisis. They could have nationalized the banks at that time. They had lots of room to really make fundamental systems redesign. Those opportunities are going to come into being. So using scenario planning, you can identify the crises that are going to create windows of opportunity for more fundamental systems redesign. And you can be there at the ready with the white papers or the thought through new coding or rule sets that are going to make a difference. And you're the, guy, the kind of guys who can think in those terms. We really do need that kind of leadership. And you don't have to tackle the project as a current deliverable that you have to come up with this month or this year in order to begin to prepare yourself to be the kind of person and in the kind of position that can make that kind of difference. So that's kind of what I'm hoping you'll do. Uh, it relates to the question, it relates to the point about being epistemically humble um, and showing humility from your particular worldview and being open to other worldviews. So for example, from the innovator's perspective, uh, being really opening up to the perspectives of the ecologists and the evolutionaries. Uh, potentially, an innovator would think that being open to data, for example, uh, as is the innovator's mindset, is kind of an epistemically humble thing to do uh, because you're being open to the data that's presented to you. So to be open to ecologists and evolutionaries, what would that look like in practice? Uh, how would you become more epistemically humble from your the, particular The main thing is that you would need to, rec you would have to recognize that all your data derives from data collection methods that are themselves ways of quantifying a more complex reality. And therefore, they're an incomplete map of that reality. And so the data is very powerful, but it's not omniscient. And so no matter how voluminous or good your data is, it is not uh, a total picture of 
of reality, and especially because we're facing a, a, a critical moment in which we have to make such profound whole systems change. The critical leadership can't derive from data that is gathered in the old pattern. A new pattern has to come into being. And therefore, all that you can gain from the data that you have is incredibly valuable, but it isn't a total view of things. So if you, you know, I, I think it's easy for us to become uh, inflated by our successes. And data can help us succeed famously in the marketplace and in commerce and even in the court of public opinion, academically, for example. But it won't, you know, we have the design specs for the challenge that we're all facing right now are very, very steep. Our ability to meet those design specs requires us to get past, oh, I'm doing pretty, you know, my, my income is going up, or, uh, I, you know, my, an attractive person has come into my life and I'm happy about my relationship world. Th those levels of success are wonderful, you know, wish you all the best, but we've got to crack the code of how we turn the Titanic. That's a big, big challenge. And the existing data will be of important relevance but if we worship the god of data as if it has all the answers, we're blinkered. It's, it's just this. Uh, Ken Wilber, my friend and our co-author of the book Integral Life Practice, uses the term flatland to describe the materialist, scientific, object, objectivist perspective that tends to dominate among innovators. And its biggest liability is arrogance. It succeeds in many ways, but it then becomes epistemically closed. It lacks that humility. So simply taking on board the fact that you do know a lot, you can see a lot, the data shows us a lot, it's really valuable, most people can't understand it or crunch it, and I can, and I'm able to contribute to something that's of real significance, that's not enough. That level of success, if, if, if you end up having lived a life in which you had a successful position in a corporation that was part of a pattern that destroyed the world that your great-grandchildren would have inherited, your success is pretty tainted. So if you bring in the kind of humility that cares to really be the change we want to see in the world, then your relationship to the data becomes serious and uh, you, you, you don't cease to notice all the opportunities and possibilities, but you don't confuse them with omniscience. You break be below that. And yes, letting the data inform your choices is brilliant and important, but it's not uh, a panacea. Okay, and with that, we've, we've come to the end. So Terry, on behalf of Google, thank you so much for sharing your time and wisdom with us today. Thank you. Thank you.